Welcome to the EKG Guy if this is your first time. I'm glad you're joining us and welcome back if you're returning. So we've been going through our EKG coding reference guide and now we're going to be looking at acute anterior or anterocephal MI. So we're in part seven here or part six. Okay. And we're going to look at acute anterior or anterocephal MI. Okay, and we'll look at what makes it an acute phase. Why are we seeing the injury early on and what findings suggest it? Now, if you don't have access, all you have to do is put this link into your search bar, click, put your email in, click submit, and from there you'll get an email. And from that email, there will be a link to give you access to the reference guide. Okay, so you can check that out. Now, if you want access to our course, our books, videos, uh, and so forth, you can go to www dot ekg dot md and then click there okay and the course the books everything uh, you get calipers and all the videos on there are separate from the you know over 400 that we have free so these are those ones are the ones we use for our course when we teach our students and so check that out um, we have quite a few things that are uh, launching soon so keep an eye out all right so let's get started so acute anterior or anterocephal mi so what is going on here? So again, we have anterior or anterocephal involvement. So we want to be able to look in those leads for uh, changes. Okay, so remember the precordial leads, these leads here on the right side of our standard EKG V1 through V6, what we consider our anterior leads. So anterior, you may hear V3 and V4, but usually V2 is also involved. So we've included V2 through V4. Uh, when we think of anterocephal, so you may hear of the septal leads, often you'll hear V1 to V2. And when you can combine them, you get anterocephal, so anterior and septum involved of that left ventricle, and that would include, as you would expect, leads V1 through V4. So these tend to be the leads. Sometimes you see it carry on to V5. Again, lead placement is not a perfect science, so you can't always rely on that. Sometimes you have uh, some findings that, you know, push over to the next lead, but this is in general what we see. Okay, so we're looking for that, and what we want to see are pathological Q waves, And we'll go over that as well as ST segment elevation in those leads V1 through V4. So that is key. So in V1 through V4, we want to see these changes. Okay. So they erase that there, but the Q waves as well as the ST segment elevation. Okay. Um, so you need both. If you only have the ST segment elevation without the Q waves, then that's what we call an injury pattern. Okay. So if you just have the ST elevation alone, we call this um, an injury pattern, okay? And that's an early thing that we can see. That infarct pattern is when you start to see Q waves develop and the what makes it acute is the ongoing ST segment elevation, okay? So in our course and in a number of other lectures, we look at the progression of ST segment changes over the course of time to, uh, what, to see what suggests more of an acute setting. So go back and listen to those lectures if you like. Okay, so V1 through V4, we want to see both pathological Q waves, all right, as well as ST segment elevation. Another thing that we've been mentioning is you have, you'll probably see loss or poor R wave progression in the uh, precordial leads because that whole initial area of the septum and anterior, anterior wall of the left ventricle is involved. So let's look at our leads. Here's V1. V2, V3, and V4. Notice here early on, you may see a little blip of an R wave, but mostly this is a big deflection, likely a big Q wave, okay? Same thing here, maybe a small R wave, but this is, you have loss of all those anterior forces. Maybe you start to see a real R wave there in V4, okay? But notice you have those deep loss of R wave progression in the precordial leads. You have deep Q waves that are developing, okay? Uh, and then you also have ST segment elevation. Look at this, ST segment elevated in all of these, even in V4, and maybe, just maybe, barely, uh, probably not in V5, but certainly V1 through V4, you have that acute finding of the ST segment elevation, okay? And then it's not a benign finding. This patient presented with chest pain, 
okay, that had been going on for a few hours, and this is a big infarct that has to be uh, taken care of. So uh, pathological Q waves, loss of R wave progression, and the ST segment changes in those leads are what we're looking for. Okay, so just to review the pathological Q waves, we must see at least a width of 30 milliseconds. So if you imagine, here's your QRS complex. This would be a QS complex. The width of this Q wave should be at least 30 milliseconds. Okay, so if it reaches one of those small boxes, that is sufficient. And the depth should be at least one millimeter, one of the small boxes deep, all right? Generally, it should be a little deeper than that, but uh, that's kind of what we've uh, proposed and are using here, so I uh, will stick with that. And the QS complex, uh, you may see, which is simply only a Q wave, pretty much. You don't have actually an S wave, but we call it a QS complex um, in the absence of an R wave, so that's what that is. Remember, you want to see Q waves that are the first negative deflection of a QRS complex, meaning that if you have a complex like this, okay, imagine this is your P wave, this is your QRS complex, and this is your T wave, this would be your R wave, and then this here is an S wave, okay, and then this is an R prime wave. There's no Q wave there. A Q wave it would be the first negative deflection of a complex like that. So if you had something like this, okay, this would be your P wave. This is your Q wave. This is your R wave, your S wave, and T wave, okay? In general, we call these whole complex that represents ventricular depolarization a QRS complex, okay? So uh, hopefully that makes sense. Again, so that's the pathological Q waves, all right? And the Q waves may only be a width of 20 milliseconds in V2 to V3, so keep that in mind, okay? You want to see it in the leads that we pointed out. Evidence of an acute or evolving myocardial injury, so the ST segment elevation, in at least two contiguous leads, meaning that we want to have it in at least two of these, or two of these, okay, or V3 and V4, so leads that are next to each other anatomically. That's what that means, contiguous. And in terms of the ST segment elevation, which we see here, notice that in V2 and V3, sometimes it's a little different in terms of the criteria. For men, okay, you want at least two millimeters, okay, in those leads. And notice here, there's at least, there's much more than that, maybe even five. So we've met it in there. And same thing in here, we have at least three to four uh, millimeters or small boxes in that, okay. Uh, for women, uh, you also want to have at least 1.5, okay? All other leads, one millimeter, okay? And the other anterior or anterior septal leads, which is would be V1 and V4, okay? So again, remember, we only make this diagnosis of this acute anterior or anterior septal MI when we have the pathological Q waves, ST segment elevation, and as well as the finding you may see loss of R wave progression in the precordial leads. If you just see the ST segment elevation, we code that as a myocardial injury, okay? And many of you would say, no, this is a, a STEMI. Well, when we actually code the EKG that we put out in clinical practice, this is what we're looking for, okay? So this is what we define as an acute anterior or anteroseptal MI. If there's just the ST segment elevation, then we call that an injury pattern, likely going to evolve into this, okay? So again, remember, if you want to know the evolution of changes on the EKG, just go back and listen to some of our lectures, our course, the books, we go through all that in detail. So hopefully this makes sense, all right? Again, V1 through V4, Q waves, ST segment ele elevation, and likely loss of that R wave progression as a big portion of the left ventricles involved. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available, so again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay, so this is our website, and what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute, and this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100, more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos, and this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter, okay? So 
completely separate from what you're getting online for free. Okay, these are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book. Okay, and then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide. Uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book you also get videos. So notice these are the videos okay and these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use, uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on. Okay. And then you also get our pocket EKG reference. Okay. This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier laid out there very small pocket guide available i had help with uh, my colleague dr peter noseworthy who's the head of the ekg lab here at mayo clinic and editing it so this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful so go to the ekg course you'll see examples of lectures okay why we developed this okay a lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them. OK, you can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough. OK, and you find yourself using other resources, which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access. Okay. And now we're offering 25% off, 25% off, put that code in on checkout and, uh, you'll have yourself, um, 25% off that will even it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right. Have a great day.